Okay, I, I need to see the face of somebody. So, please, somebody should switch off. And, and Alessandro, stay switched off, on. Sorry. Okay, because in this way, I try to see the expression of people while I'm talking. Okay, so yesterday uh, we ended the lecture talking about the uh, astronomical calculator of Antikythera, and we discussed the strange phenomenon that has been observed, that is that something built uh, 150 years before Christ remained the one of the most advanced uh, scientific tools for, say, another 1,700 years. Okay, uh, so one thing which we are learning in this discussion is not only the importance of scientific uh, research and understanding and uh, mathematics in producing technological devices. Not only we are learning that without uh, deep scientific understanding of models, mathematical models, we cannot produce any technological tool, but we are also learning that it is not true that science is advancing towards progress without coming back. Okay, so what we should understand is that scientific knowledge and the capacity of describing the world with mathematical tools is a delicate uh, capacity which can be lost rather easily and indeed was lost uh, very often. If you remember, Nebra Disc became a religious tool after a while because uh, it, the capacity of reading it was lost, and Antikythera mechanism uh, was simply forgotten. If uh, a ship were not sinking uh, close to the island of Antikythera, so easily uh, discoverable. And uh, if in that ship there were not such a delicate mechanism, even the knowledge about the past existence of these tools were lost. Um, so, the the uh, the idea is that uh, you are not only uh, students of applied mathematics or engineering who must learn how to do your profession or your work. You must also become a part of the uh, how to say intelligentsia intelligence of humankind. And you must the living storage uh, of knowledge, because without persons knowing how to read books, books very soon become obsolete. Le let's proceed in our presentation. I, I want to explain you why the death of Archimedes can be regarded as the beginning of the end of science and scientific technology. You must understand that Marcellus, who was the consul, the Roman consul who conquered Syracuse, was uh, the leader of uh, a state based on democracy or some democratic institutions, he was elected, he had been elected consul, together with another consul, because in Rome, the executive power was in the hands of two consuls. One was alternating with the other uh, in power. One day, one consul, the other day, the other consul. 
So in this way, they must, uh, they had to agree about what they wanted to do. Otherwise, uh, uh, there was no uh, active action in any direction. Uh, Marcellus uh, was also the leader of a very primitive army. Uh, what is very strange is that Plutarch, when talking about the siege of Syracuse, talks about a number of deaths on the Roman side, which is much higher than the number of deaths of, of the side of Syracuse. Now the question is, how is it possible that the losers uh, had uh, such a uh, small amount of death uh, casualties during this siege? Uh, the explanation is written already in Plutarch's uh, uh, chronicles. Uh, uh, Marcello could take Syracuse uh, could conquer Syracuse simply because a group of Syracusans opened the doors of the city, the gates of the city, to the conquerors because they were against the tyrant having the power in the city. So while Syracuse was much more advanced scientifically, uh, Romans could conquer Syracuse, notwithstanding the enormous technological gap between the two societies, simply because uh, Syracusans were not well organized. They had not a stable system of institutions. So you should think that in order to have a successful society, you do not need only the atomic bomb. Think about Soviet Union. You need a system uh, for organizing the, the, uh, the, the control of power. So you need a kind of democracy together with a very advanced science and technology. Uh, here I want to tell you that uh, uh, ships were burned by Syracusans, uh, and the Romans even did not manage to understand how it was possible that their ships were burned. Uh, they uh, were telling stories about uh, mirrors which were burning the sails of the ships. Now, it has been proven uh, that it is impossible to convey enough energy with burning mirrors towards the ships uh, for burning the, the, the sails, most likely we can conjecture that the mirrors uh, supplied a system for measuring the distance of the ship from, from the walls, so that uh, using this kind, you know, it is like the modern laser beams concentrating at a distance for measuring via triangulation the distances. And then the sails were burned by balls fired by um, a famous uh, uh, com uh, burning system uh, based on a chemical product which has been longly called the Greek fire. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, how do we know that uh, Syracuse was much more advanced than, than uh, Romans? Because Marcellus, entering the city of Syracuse, uh, took Archimedes Planetarium uh, as a booty of, of his uh, conquer, and uh, Cicero, many years later, described this planetarium as he could see in the, in the house of the descendants of Marcellus. This planetarium had the possibility of blocking both the Earth or the Sun, and it could uh, describe, it could show the motion of planets relatively to the Earth or 
relativity to the sun. And this mechanism is very clever because it was showing the essence of Aristarchus and Hipparchus heliocentric model, and it was showing how the apparent motion of stars with respect to the Earth could be calculated using this uh, analog uh, computer, which is uh, this kind of mechanical, uh, the, this mechanism, if you want. Okay, so actually, uh, we can say that uh, the man who had built this planetarium knew how to change an observer. So in a, in a way, the understanding uh, much later gained by Galileo most likely was uh, available to the uh, Syracusans scientists. Okay. So, <clears throat> I want to understand together with you that later Ptolemy, who is a famous uh, author of uh, a book whose object is how to build mechanisms for uh, predicting the, mo the apparent motion of planets as seen by the Earth. Okay, so I want to say how Ptolemy uh, uh, books was misunderstood later, so that very often you read in books that uh, the, the vision of the universe in which the Earth is in the center and the planets are running around this center was the Ptolemaic system. It is not true. We know because we have all books, including Ptolemy's book, we know that this was Eudoxus model, the geocentric one. Ptolemy was a kind of numerical analyst. Ptolemy's aim was to teach how to build computers uh, for calculating the position of planets and stars are, as seen by the Earth. So uh, Ptolemy did develop a little bit uh, the models of Hipparchus, uh, the kinematical description of Hipparchus. I, I told you in the last lecture that Seleucus is attributed uh, of a, a big advancement. Uh, Plutarch says that Seleucus was demonstrating Hipparchus' uh, model for the planetary motion. So we must presume that Selegus had a kind of uh, dynamics. He could deduce these motions from uh, more fundamental principles, more or less as has been done much later by Newton. Okay, but uh, uh, so Ptolemy was describing Hipparchus kinematical algorithm, and I want to show you shortly how he was doing it. He was considering a circle, this C0, a big circle, and then a small circle, okay? And then he was placing the planet uh, in the circumference of the small circle, okay? And he was blocking, uh, he was moving this planet as a composition of the motion of the center of C in the big circle, and the motion of the planet around, in, around the center C, and it was linking the angles eta, lambda, and gamma in such a way to get the apparent motion of, of the planet as seen by the Earth. Okay, Ptolemy invented another, another algorithm, and in this algorithm you have always a big circle, okay? Then you move a point in this circle. When this, this point here is here, 
Then you calculate this eta angle. You, you calculate another angle of the other side. Then you trace the tangent to this circumference and you find where this tangent is intersecting the prolongation of the radius corresponding to this point. In this way, you calculate the center of the second circle, okay? And then you move with an angle gamma, which is related to the angle eta, the planet along the circumference of this C1. Why I want to describe you carefully this uh, composition of circular motions, because I want to tell you that both Hipparchus and most likely also Ptolemy knew that this is a, this is a pure mathematical model. No, no one, no Ptolemy, no, nor Aristarchus imagined metallic uh, guides on which this point was moving, or they did not imagine a complex system of uh, pivots and rotating circles for for uh, building uh, a, a device uh, to which this material point representing, for instance, the moon was glued. They first imagine an algorithm for calculating the motion, and then eventually they wanted to build the the analog calculator which uh, could predict the motion of the planets. Okay, Giovanni Galavotti is a modern scientist still living who uh, managed to interconnect the theory of Fourier series development for periodic motion, okay, and the algorithm used by Ptolemy in the Almagest. So actually, both Hipparchus and Ptolemy were inventing a generic method for describing every periodic motion. You add another epicycle. epicycle. Imagine that with these two epicycles, you don't manage to describe carefully the periodic motion of the moon. Then what you do? You invent a, a smaller circle here and you place the moon running around this second point. And you can increase the number of deference, which are the subsequent circles. And in this way, you are, in a sense, introducing the superior harmonics in a Fourier series. So Galavotti has mathematically proven that actually what Ptolemy is doing is exactly a Fourier series. Now, I, I don't want to suggest you anything. I simply underline the circumstance that Fourier was following Napoleon in Egypt in the famous uh, campaign of Egypt by Napoleon and that he came back in Paris with many books. Nobody knows wh which books he found in, in Egypt. And he had his ideas about this serious development after this participation. And, you know, Alexandria in Egypt, as we said, uh, was a place where many books had been stored in the past. Okay. Uh, and then Ptolemy invents another better way. So instead of uh, building the circle, as I said before, uh, uh, and moving the, the, the moon, as I said before, he introduces another prolongation uh, using another more complicated construction for more carefully describing the, the motion of the moon. But I mean, this is not important, the technical detail. I mean, 
what is important is to recognize that Ptolemy confuses the theory with the instrument of calculation. So actually, Ptolemy resembles very much some modern scholars who believe that the theory is the software they are using. I will tell you this nice story because I think it is very important for you to understand this. Many years ago, I met a group of engineers from uh, an important company building airplanes. <clears throat> they wanted uh, us to help them in designing wings. So I told them that the old continuum mechanics uh, developed by uh, Cauchy had been improved and that we had a more modern model uh, describing in a better way the behavior of deformable bodies. So I said, you know, nowadays we are using uh, Coursera theory for deformable body or generalized continuum theories so we can help you uh, producing better models. One of the engineers stopped me and said, don't worry, we already uh, uh, understood that Cauchy theory is uh, surpassed. We are using Nastran. So actually, they, like Ptolemy, they confused the tool for calculating solutions of partial differential equations with the partial differential equations. So they imagined that their computing tool was the theory. I claim that Ptolemy is doing the same. And most likely he contributes, contributes to start the decadence process that it is completed at the end, at the end, when the theory is confused with reality. What happened with the decadence of the Greek knowledge? I want to underline for you that, in my opinion, the decadence of the Roman Empire started with the siege of Syracuse. Most likely, Romans were too quick in conquering Greek states. And in this way, they were not well educated enough to understand the culture of the societies they were conquering. And they needed 300 years for arriving to Cicero, but Cicero had no teacher in mathematics who knew the mathematics. So at the end, these uh, uh, scholars like Cicero, Lucretius, they understood that in their hands they had very important books, but they could not really uh, appreciate their mathematical content. In the Rerum Natura by Lucretius, you find, you know, the notes of a student who is not understanding what he's reading. He knows that what he's reading is very important, but he doesn't manage to catch the technical details of, of what he's reading. So, uh, the, 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 uh, my opinion is that uh, Greek-Roman uh, civilization, uh, having a time delay, say 300 years more or less of delay, okay, did not manage to be in phase for what concerns scientific knowledge and technological knowledge. So Romans were using, Romans were using the technical recipes, which were written in the Greek books they had in their hands without understanding the theory behind it. I want to give you uh, an important example because I think it is very important in this discussion. I hope that you have heard about uh, Bernoulli law of fluid flow. Okay, 
Bernoulli law of fluid flow tells you that conservation of energy. So it, it tells you that in a flow in a pressurized pipe, you have that the gravitational height plus the, the pressure plus the velocity are a constant with suitable coefficients and expression. Bernoulli theory is essential for building pressurized aqueducts, okay? Now, in Pergamon, uh, uh, German archaeologists found a pressurized aqueduct. Uh, now the museum in Berlin, it is closed, but I could see it before it was closed. You see in Berlin the pipes taken from Pergamon, and these pipes were part of an aqueduct which was uh, driving water through a valley which was long five kilometers and deep one and a half kilometer. So they could build a pressurized uh, aqueduct arriving up to the Acropolis in Pergamon. Okay. Now, if you walk in Rome, you see the Roman aqueduct. What are the Roman aqueducts? They are rivers. They did not know how to build pressurized aqueducts. They built some rivers and uh, uh, 80 kilometers far in, in the Apennines, there was a source and they built a slow slope from the Apennines to Rome for, bu for uh, building so-called aqua marcia. Uh, uh, Marcus was the consul who did it aqueduct, okay, for giving water to Rome. Now, do you know how much was the price of this primitive aqueduct? It was one third of the whole gross product of the Roman Empire. So they had lost the theory. They could not build the aqueduct, pressurized aqueduct, and in order to do the same, they spend a lot of money. By the way, if you go to Pompeii, you discover that in the city, the distribution of water is uh, made by a pressurized aqueduct. I conjecture that there was a book of hydraulics with the theory. Then there was a book of how to build this big aqueduct. So in modern languages, you have the book of theoretical hydraulics. Then you have the book of constructions of big aqueducts. And then you have the book of construction of small aqueduct. So you had three books. A very clever teacher during Roman epoch decided theory useless and they didn't copy anymore the book of hydraulics. They started building small aqueducts. So somebody said, OK, do we need big aqueducts? No, I mean, this is useless for students. In practice, engineering students don't need this complicated book. So they stopped copying also big aqueduct book. So when they needed big aqueducts, after two centuries, they had lost the uh, scientific and technological knowledge for doing this. This process of decadence has to be contrasted. We must fight against it. So not only I should teach you some formulas, some theories, some models, how to model physical phenomena. I must also teach you that you are the Templar uh, knight, uh, knights. 
Okay, you are preserving knowledge. And in your mind, it has to be clear that science without technology is useless, but technology without science dies. And they are all living together. Okay, so both of them must grow together. Okay, let's proceed. After 600, 600 years of decadence, the greatest mathematician of the period was Beda the Venerable. You know the greatest contribution of Beda the Venerable? He invented a method of counting to a million with the fingers of his hands. This was the biggest contribution to science. By the way, geometry, Euclid elements, was almost intact, was, had been, uh, has been taught to students for all these dark centuries. And I am really sure that it is only thanks to the education in abstract thought given by geometry that a return to science was possible in the Renaissance. What happened? Teachers are conservative. So they knew that every intellectual has to study geometry. This was the old tradition. And they kept teaching geometry all the time during Middle Ages. Okay. And in this way, even if this complicated construction or that complicated construction was taught without knowing why you are doing it, okay? The fact that people were learning geometry uh, prepared Renaissance, okay? But before we discuss about Renaissance, we must discover what happened when the decadence started. And this was in the early medieval decadence. This is a pictorial description of the known universe. And, you know, you have a very strange uh, description of a small part of the world. Uh, it is flat or it is spherical. We don't understand really if this is a sphere or it is a disk, and you have the heavens, nine heavens, okay? And so, as happened in the Nebra disk, the scientific content of Eudoxus theory is lost, and the, theories, the theory was replaced by a religious belief. So the first sky, moon, was occupied by angels, and the science relative to this sky was grammatics. So you see, you see, they, by the way, they knew that physics was very important, so they placed at the eighth uh, sky, okay, but of course, theology was at the tenth sky, okay? So the old theory describing the in, in great uh, detail, the relative motion as seen by the Earth of the planets described by a complicated algorithm, very similar to Fourier series expansion, okay? This became this drawing with a very primitive explanation of some ancient rules whose and words whose meaning had been lost. But the final step is, this is the universe. So, our millary spheres, this complicated mechanism used for describing the motion of the planets, this mechanism became the physical reality. People during Middle Age, really believed that the universe is made like that. You have the Earth, 
you have the, the sun moving on a crystal metallic sphere and you know you see this explorer who arrives where the first sphere ends and looks through it so these these uh, scholars confused fully the uh, mathematical model the computational tool used for getting predictions and the physical reality so they managed to identify the moon the sky the stars and the eudoxus model for this for the phenomena occurring to this object the reason for which in this course i will distinguish in a paranoic way mathematical model and physical object even finding different names for the mathematical object and the physical object which is modeled by the mathematical object the reason is that i don't want that you ever confuse the mathematical object with the physical object it is modeling okay this confusing confusion has to be avoided the end of the materialization is this drawing eudoxus model becomes theology and we you have angels around the center of the earth and the paradise is somewhere at the end of these circles at the very top of these circles okay after this decadence luckily for us you had a very slow recovery of the ancient uh, science one uh, by the way uh, you should not consider you know when i was young i was strongly against uh, roman catholic church and every religion uh, this, this is a stupid a stupid behavior because inside roman catholic church you had some monks who understood the ancient theory maybe small pieces of ancient theories and they worked for rediscovering it okay moreover the tradition catholic tradition of refuse of violence had been very important for uh, organizing societies where you don't have systematic killing of other people of course inside the church you find everything you find the violent crusader and the peaceful monk who wants peace okay but this is human beings human beings are like that okay let's let's talk about few examples of uh, uh, scholars who worked in middle age and contributed to uh, recover the ancient science i have selected these uh, scholars with a view towards the typical mistakes of modern students okay in in making some reasonings william of ockham uh, uh, formulated a meta theory which is necessary to formulate theories so uh, let us interpret ockham reasoning you want to describe a phenomenon to be specific you want to describe the motion of planets as seen by the earth okay then you must decide which are your basic assumptions so for instance you have eudoxus model you assume that the earth is in the center and that you have the planets running around it 
But in order to describe the upper end motion of the planets, you need to invent circles, epicycles, deference. You must introduce uh, three spheres for the sun and the moon, and you must introduce four spheres for the other planets. So the number of assumptions you are using for describing the motion of the planets are many. And for each planet, you must invent the suitable system of moving spheres. OK, then think about Aristarchus or Copernicus model. In Aristarchus and Copernicus model, model you place the sun in the center. And all motions are circular. Period. So the number of assumptions which you accept for formulating the model Copernican Aristarchus model, or for formulating uh, Eudoxus uh, Ptolemaic model, the, the, the number of assumptions are different. And there is one model which can be built with a smaller number of hypotheses. So, Occam Razor tells you, Cheddar is paribus when all the other things are equal. So with equal predictivity, prefer the simplest. So when Jesuits were attacking Galileo, telling him that in reality, Ptolemy algorithm was describing with a better detail the apparent motion of planets, because you know, uh, the, the motion of planets is not a circle, it is an ellipse. So if you introduce a model in which the motion is a circle, you get some small errors in, in, in your prediction because they are ellipses which resemble circles, but they are not exactly a circle. So in the model of uh, Copernicus, you could have here and there bigger errors in the prediction as compared with the uh, Ptolemy model using 20 epicycles. Because, you know, in a Fourier series, you can approximate as carefully as you uh, can, uh, as you was, uh, uh, as you wish, uh, the, the, the periodic motion, okay? However, Copernicus, using Occam Razor, said choosing between two theories is simple. I choose the theory which uses a smaller amount of assumptions. Okay, so he gave you a meta theory. Meta in Greek means beyond. So it is a theory whose object is other theory, is the theory of the theory, is the theory teaching you how to build a theory, okay? And Occam Razor tells you that choose the minimum possible of assumptions, okay? Uh, we don't want to be European-centric, so I tried, uh, maybe yesterday you heard my friend Anil Misra, who is of Indian uh, origin, and he, he will want to add some uh, parts of Indian history of science uh, uh, to this presentation. Okay, but I want to uh, remem remember, uh, recall that there was another philosopher from uh, Arab philosopher whose name in, in, uh, in English is Avicenna. This philosopher tried to build a logic alternative to Aristotelian logic. Aristotelian logic is a, a logic uh, which deduces 
from some postulates, all theorems which are true if the postulates are true. OK, so Aristotle does not try to develop a logic in which experience is telling you which statement is true. OK, Aristotle most likely was a falsificationist. I will tell you in a few uh, minutes what I mean with the with the word falsificationist. Uh, I, I, I now now I tell you Aristotle was a philosopher who believed that you wake up one morning out of the blue with your inventiveness. OK, you invent a postulate. The postulate can be in our context. All planets move around the sun in a circular motion or another postulate can be every isolated uh, body as observed from a specific uh, reference system which exists is and is called inertial system moves with a rectilinear constant velocity okay uh, you you accept these postulates which cannot be proven okay can only be falsified you can find some consequences of these postulates which are not true okay then starting from these postulates you deduce logically all all the consequences i will come back many times on this on this point instead avicenna tried to invent a logic in which experience is producing true statements of general value okay and avicenna can be considered one of the founders of modern inductivism inductivism is that school of philosophy of science in which scholars believe to be able to induce from experience the validity of some laws okay Then again, talking about uh, the difficulties in the progress of science, I want to underline that there are many anachronisms in the history of science. An anachronism is when something strange happens who, which should not be observed in that epoch, for instance finding the antikythera mechanism it is a kind of anachronism why because you did not expect such an advanced technological tool in that place in that period in that period of human history okay uh, leo the mathematician he was also called leo the geometrician uh, uh, lived in the uh, between 719 and 869 in Byzantium, and this man promoted the revival of mathematical studies, copied many texts of Archimedes, and he is called the uh, promoter of so-called Macedonian Renaissance in Byzantium. He, he has been called a true Renaissance man or the smartest man in Byzantium in, Byzantium in the ninth century. This man is the reason for which we have in our hands the books of Archimedes. And this man was the one who promoted the copy of all works by Archimedes and the study of the works of Archimedes. So that we must say that Leo the mathematician did manage to prolong 
the span of ancient Hellenistic science up to the Renaissance, which occurred in uh, Europe, in Italy, uh, much later. So you find in Leo the Mathematician uh, uh, text some ideas which will be rediscovered later. Here I want to uh, uh, underline that John Philoponus worked in Byzantium and uh, even earlier than Leo the Mathematician uh, left us uh, books in which the concept of impetus was introduced and this is nothing else than inertia. So we must suspect that uh, in Byzantium, seven century after Christ, they could read books in which the law of inertia was formulated. In late Middle Ages, the slow rediscovery of the distinction between model and real objects. Uh, Thomas Bravardine was called Doctor Profundus. We do not know very much about uh, Bravardine because we simply know that he was more or less 40 years old at, in 1330. He wrote a book distinguishing kinematics from dynamics. You know, this is very suspectful. You don't have books talking about a careful presentation of dynamics. You don't have books describing modern concepts of kinematics. However, you find somebody who writes attention. There is a difference between kinematics and dynamics. So the strong suspicion is that he was reading books, copying more or less carefully uh, these books, and he was copying only what he could understand. But what is in interesting is that Thomas Bravardine introduces the concept of instantaneous velocity and also much before than Galileo discusses the law of falling bodies. This picture of Nicolas Doresme attracted my attention because, you know, his contemporary believed that this man is a little bit crazy. You know, he's a uh, a strange person. He uses some pieces of glass for reading. Okay, so probably Nicolas Dores had found some uh, ancient textbook in optics and could build his own spectacles for reading even when he became presbyop. He was the institutor of the heir of the Kingdom of France and he studied the universe using mathematical methods. In particular, in Nicolas Dores, you find the principle of Galilean invariance. Another time, he wrote about so many topics that the strong uh, suspicion is that he was, uh, he was, uh, reading other books. So is a secondary source. By the way, in Nicolas Dores, you find the basic ideas of analytical geometry. So either he, he had invented them, it, or he rediscovered it, reading ancient books. So having clarified that science is an activity having back and forth. And having clarified that the most basic ideas from scientific Hellenistic science is the meta theory by Occam and the debate about somebody who believes that you can generalize a physical law by observing many phenomena. So you can formulate a physical law, like Avicenna was claiming, you observe many things 
and then you formulate a physical law, or the other school claiming that you conjecture a postulate as a basis of your theory, and then you check if your conjecture is uh, in agreement uh, with, with, with evidence. By the way, I also want to uh, uh, tell you something else, which is very important, will become very important soon in our discussion. The same phenomena, the apparent motion of planets as seen by the Earth, are compatible with two different models. Because if you introduce enough AP cycles, okay, you describe carefully this, this uh, experimental evidence. Otherwise, if you introduce uh, circles or a, 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 a ellipses, you also can describe very carefully placing the sun in one of the uh, one of, of the foci of the uh, ellipses. You can you can describe uh, with the same accuracy the the motion of the planets as seen by the Earth. So the same experimental evidence can be explained by two different by two different models. Okay, so how do you use, how do you choose among them? With Occam razor, you choose the simplest. Okay, so after having developed these ideas, we can now uh, ask ourselves a question: Is there a theory describing the birth, growth, and decay? of scientific theories and scientific technology? This is the meta theory we, we want to discover together with William of Ockham. Now, we can say that history of science is a kind of set of observed facts, while philosophy of science is a theory organizing observed facts. Okay. So what I mean is that uh, not only I wanted, and I will keep doing this, I wanted to tell you some facts about ancient science and ancient, uh, uh, ancient uh, technology, because I wanted to prove you that in history of uh, humankind, you had moments with great flourishing of science and then the de de decadence, and then uh, again you rediscover ancient science and so on. And who knows how many cycles of this uh, can be observed, uh, could be observed in history of humankind. But I also want to tell you that there is a serious effort in organizing uh, history of science using a philosophy of science which tries to give you an idea of how um, the scientific effort can be organized and how the scientific effort can produce uh, can produce results. I already uh, show I have shown you the uh, spinning top and the trick track, two toys invented by Hellenistic scientists for uh, proving the validity of some physical uh, 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 models for physical evidence. Here I, I show you another toy uh, whose description can be found in the Heron of Alexandria textbook about uh, machines. And this is a tool which moves that wheel. Its Greek name is Eulopia. It means something moving because of wind. Okay. And here you find a demonstrator of the principle, of the first principle of thermodynamics. Heat 
can be transformed in motion. Okay. So, uh, by the way, we have uh, uh, archaeological evidence that Greeks were moving big doors of Templar using uh, vapor. So, engine, uh, vapor engines in a form uh, were already known during that, uh, that period. Okay. One uh, philosophical uh, point of view in philosophy of science, one point of view in philosophy of science is the following. Humankind observes uh, phenomena, tries to build something, it doesn't manage to build it, and with trials, failures, and new trials, he slowly discovers clever solutions for uh, getting technological tools. So this is so-called practical point of view. Uh, some engineers claim that everything has been done with practice, trials and errors procedure. So I want to tell you that this point of view is most likely not founded. Why? This is a tool which human beings developed 2.5 to 1.2 million years ago. Okay? 9,000 years ago, they managed to develop this tool. Uh, by the way, genetically, 9,000 years ago, humankind was exactly as it is now. Okay? So you may say that 2 million years ago, we had no true Homo sapiens sapiens. We had another species. So they were not clever enough. So, okay, let us move to 9,000 years ago. Okay? Then you needed 6,000 years for developing these more sophisticated tools, okay? Then you have the Antikythera mechanism, the catapult used by Syracusans for killing many Roman soldiers. Consider that the number of turns of this wheel here gives you the impulse of this ball so that uh, uh, turning this a certain number of times, you can throw this at different distances. Okay. During Middle Ages, catapults were throwing balls at one unique fixed distance. Okay. And then you had a big floating ship, the Syracusia, which was enormous, several football fields big. Okay, there was a big library on, on the top of it. Okay, so if you draw a timeline of technological uh, development, here you find the first technological artifact, here you find the most evolved, but even if you start from here, you see everything happened very recently, okay? So, the strong suspicion is that something happened here. Now, the debate in that instant, now the debate among scholars talking about the process of scientific discovery is even more complicated than that. There is a group of scientists who claim that, for instance, the wheel has been invented simultaneously by every society which reached a certain development stage. So, in a sense, they believe that any, every social group is experiencing the same sequence of 
development in science and technology so that Indians in India rediscovered trigonometry independently of the discovery of trigonometry made by Greeks and Chinese discovered some parts of mathematics independently of the discovery of Greeks. Okay. So this is so-called uh, diffusionism. Uh, I am, uh, uh, I appreciate greatly Giovan Battista Vico philosophy. Giovan Battista Vico was a Neapolitan philosopher. He wanted to reproduce for social sciences the big discoveries made by Newton in physics. Okay. I agree with Giovanni Battista Vigo when he claims that in history you have cycles. So you have big increase of science, then you have decadence, then you have again an increase of scientific knowledge, then you have another decadence, or you have, you know, the famous triad. You have kings, republic, empire. If you look at the history of humankind, you always find kings, then republic, then empire. This happened for Venice. This, uh, sometimes you freeze it, okay? Of course, you know, in, in, in Britain, the king was very clever. When he understood that democracy was becoming too dangerous, they gave up completely, they renounced all their power for remaining formally the king. So they have a parliament uh, uh, which is behaving like a democracy. Of course, you need to adapt these cycles to the uh, several circumstances. However, I disagree with Giovanni Battista Vico when he claims that similar ideas originating among entire peoples unknown to each other must have a common basis of truth. So he claims in an extreme version of diffusionism that only something which is reinvented in many parts by different groups of human people becomes well established. Okay. I don't think so. I think that uh, fundamental ideas are invented one time by humankind, then maybe they are partially lost or completely lost, but this invention is spread everywhere. Uh, uh, we should not be too primitivist. You know, the if you go in Rome, it is a pity that you cannot travel in this moment. There is a nice museum in Rome, close to the uh, Termini station. Uh, it is in Palazzo Massimo. In the under ground uh, of this uh, museum, you find the tomb of an, a girl a buried during Roman Empire, late Republic, beginning of Roman Empire in Rome, and they found the body and the tomb intact. And they took everything which was inside, including the body of the poor girl, and they exhibit, exhibit there. Okay, you find the jewels of this girl. What do you find? Amber from Siberia and some precious stones from Ceylon. So the question is, if a stone can travel from Ceylon to Rome and be part of a jewel of a girl, then the definition of sinus of an angle can travel from Greece to India. Okay? It is even lighter to transport. You don't need a big bag for transporting this idea. Okay? So we know for sure that Alexander the Great founded a kingdom in India. 
and that many mathematicians were active at the boundary of India. Okay, so why not imagining that these Greeks talking with the Indians made an Indi Indo-Greek school of mathematics developing parts of parts of trigonometry? So. Uh, I strongly believe that an explanation of this phenomenon, that every technological discovery is concentrated the third century before Christ and then spreading, and only uh, after some um, centuries uh, we had some um, growth of these ideas, this is the related to the fact that uh, the deterministic vision of the invention of ideas and technology can uh, is is the correct one. Okay. Now let us uh, move towards a main philosophical uh, concept. Let us discuss a little bit about two different two different visions of philosophy of science and when i was 20 years old i was taught that one of these uh, possible viewpoints was totally obsolete and they were teaching me as something part of history of philosophy of science and then that I'm running quickly towards my 60 years of life so in a span of time of only 40 years I see a revival of this presumed uh, dead uh, uh, vision of philosophy of science so I want to talk about inductivism and falsificationism about which we already discussed okay and i claim that both of them can be tracked back to some extent to hellenistic thought okay uh, once more surviving sources are so rare that it is very difficult to know whether a debate took place between hellenistic scientists about this but it is sure, I will tell you why, that uh, in Hellenistic times, this debate was, was present. Now, uh, in order to tell you uh, what is a naive inductivist, I tell you the story invented by Bertrand Russell about the famous Russell chicken. By the way, somebody talks about uh, uh, a turkey, but I went to check the original source. Uh, Bertrand Russell talks about a chicken. Okay. The chicken of Bertrand Russell is a serious scientist follower of Avicenna. He claims that he can in a state by careful prolongated and clever observation, he can state a true statement about physical reality. Okay. So this chicken starts observing when his landlord, his landlord is feeding him. You know, from the point of view of the chicken being fed is extremely important. Okay, so what is doing? He is very careful. Summertime, the landlord, the farmer, is feeding him seven o'clock in the morning. When it is raining, he is fed seven o'clock in the morning. When it is hot, when it is fresh, when the wife of the farmer is upset when the uh, uh, wife of the farmer is happy, when there is the son of the farmer in the farm, and when there is no... Okay, I could continue this story hours. Uh, Bertrand Russell writes two pages 
just for making it fun. Okay. Then the day before Christmas, he finally states the theory. The farmer feeds me every morning seven o'clock. The day after, the farmer kills him because it is Christmas and his wife must prepare the, the dinner for Christmas. Okay? This story tells you very precisely what is inductivism. People believing in inductivism claim that it is possible to formulate general statements about physical reality, general statements which are true, okay, simply repeating many times an observation. Okay. On the other hand, falsificationists have another uh, way for describing how science is formulated. Think about, about Edox, Eudoxus. Eudoxus watches at the stars. You remember the picture I've shown you yesterday. Looks at the motion of the stars in circles. And then he conjectures. I can describe the motion of the stars using circular motion. Then he starts making measurements and he discovers that it is not true. He needs an epicycle. So what he's doing? He mounts one sphere inside the other, forgetting the composition of two circular motions, because you have a pivot be between these two spheres, okay? And in, in this way, you can approximate better the motion of the planet. Then he discovers that he needs four spheres for Mars and is not describing retrograde motion. And three spheres are enough for the moon. So it is clear that he is aware of the fact that he needs many epicycles. Okay. Then Aristarchus invents another conjecture. He says, why not assuming that the Earth is not in the center of the universe and assuming instead that the Sun is in the center of the universe? Okay. He gets, like Copernicus has proven, the same predictive capacity. However, with a model which is simpler. So using Occam razor, he prefers uh, heliocentric model. Now, falsificationists are never happy. They never stop conjecturing because they know that tomorrow a certain model can be falsified by an observation. I want to give you this before we proceed. This idea. Mercury, unfortunately, cannot be described using Newton law of gravitational attraction. The big problem of Mercury is that it, it, its speed in its motion around the sun is so high that you need general relativity for describing its motion. So you need relativistic correction to the equation of the motion of Mars. So while everything works for all the other planets and you are happy with a Newtonian model, we should call it Hipparchus model. Who knows? The first book we have in our hands 
is Newton. So we call it Newtonian model. Okay. We must be always ready to change our conjecture and to introduce another model which uh, gives us a better description. And there is no way for, in a unique way, determining the structure of a theory. As the example of Eudoxus model and Aristarchus model is teaching us. OK, now I want uh, to uh, tell something about this problem, you know, uh, by the way, maybe it is worth that I, uh, I tell you that. Uh, of course, I was born in, in South Italy, so. It is clear that I like with great pleasure when I see Greek scientists uh, uh, doing something very important, which has uh, changed the way in which humankind is uh, observing reality. Because uh, I may be considered a philosopher of uh, Magna Grecia, okay? However, you know, I recently discovered that my family comes from a castle, and this castle was owned by a Longobard barbarian coming from from Sweden and walking several thousand years until they arrived in, in South Italy, conquering that castle. Uh, we don't belong. We are all human beings. Uh, the only peculiarity of Greek uh, science is that it was written in Greek. OK. And the only the only peculiarity of my science is that I'm writing in English my papers. But nobody can claim that I'm British. OK, so what I want to say is that we are human beings and we try to understand. That's it. OK, there is no skin color, education, history, tradition. If somebody came to me and he proves a correct theorem, he's a good mathematician, independently of uh, its place of birth and is a small segment of DNA which makes him belonging to a group in, instead of another. OK, I, I wanted to tell this because I received yesterday a mail, anonymous mail, telling me that uh, I, I am crazy. I believe that everything has been done by Greeks and that instead Persian did a lot. So I immediately agree that Persians did a lot. Of course, I can tell you in uh, in secret that they did a lot when Alexander the Great conquered them and uh, the Greek mathematicians uh, who were traveling with him taught to the Persians some mathematics so that tomorrow I will receive another mail complaining about it. Uh, uh, look, I, I really don't mind uh, to say that uh, uh, geometry or the principle of inertia has been invented by Greek scientists. I am interested to another aspect of the story. How mechanics was invented. I want to understand how the first inventor of the principle of mechanics or the first inventor of falsificationism or the first inventor of every theory, I want to understand how this theory was formulated the first time. And why I am interested in this? Because I have the arrogance to be willing to invent something new myself and to have my PhD students inventing something new together with me. OK, so I need to teach the secret of invention of new theories. So to see 
the root of revolutionary ideas is very important because if the balance of force was invented for describing the equilibrium of the lever, or if the principle of virtual work was invented for describing the equilibrium of the lever, is a very important question. Because if I want to generalize mechanics, should I use the balance of force or should I use the principle of virtual work? Most likely, the tool, conceptual tool, which was useful for inventing the equilibrium of the lever, lever is the correct conceptual tool for inventing generalized continuum mechanics. Okay? So, please tell to the anonymous student who wrote me that I'm crazy about Greeks, that if somebody came to me with an Indian text written in the 7th century before Christ, in which the equilibrium of the level is studied in a different way as it is described in Mechanica Problemata, I am ready to change my point of view and I will use the method written in the Indian textbook. Okay, so it is not a question of uh, superiority of Western civilization. This is garbage. These ideas are garbage. This is the superiority of the principle of virtual work, period. Okay, it's not the superiority of a social group compared with another one. I, I want to underline this. I, I never imagined that I could be reached by such a male. So it is important that I tell you this. Okay. Now, now Proclus is already fourth century after Christ. So it is already a decadent uh, scholar and discusses the nature of epicycles. And look how important it is. Do they exist? or are they pure mathematical hypotheses? So there was a philosopher of science, fourth century after Christ, who wrote a book, Hypotheposis, Exposition of Astronomical Hypotheses. So this man was writing a book of philosophy of science applied to the models for the planetary motion, okay? And he asks himself if epicycles are true existing objects or if they are pure mathematical hypotheses, okay? Look, the question is, is still good because, you know, uh, uh, you remember Sextus Empiricus claims that mathematical hypotheses are not existing at all. I mean, Mathematics is not existing. Okay. Now, what is uh, very interesting is that Proclus is a post scientific philosopher. So he discussed the egos of a debate and manages to deny the validity of both positions. So, for being politically correct, he says that epicycles are not existing and they are not even mathematical hypotheses. Okay, which is rather amusing, if you like, okay? Okay, now, I, uh, uh, as you are also students in mathematics, I, I want uh, to talk about uh, uh, another uh, position about the existence of mathematical objects, okay? Ontology is a Greek word which means discussion about being. Ontology is that part of philosophy who talks about the existence of objects 
outside our mind. So the ontology talks about uh, the, the problems we are discussing in this moment. Uh, the epicycle is a physical object or is it a mathematical hypothesis? This is a part of ontology. Okay. Proclus is a follower of Plato. You know, Plato had a very interesting philosophical position. He invented mathematical Platonism. Instead of trying to tell you what is Platonism, let us read Hardy. Hardy is an historian of mathematics of 20th century. He claims that mathematical Platonism is based on the statement, mathematical reality lies outside us and our function is to discover and observe it and the theorems we prove are simply the accounts of our observations. Okay? So I, for having some fun, I, I wrote, I took this picture and uh, I, I, I want to joke and telling you that mathematicians have special X-ray uh, spectacles, glasses, and they are the strange human beings who walk in the street and they meet a derivative. And they say, ah, you are a derivative. And then they meet uh, the, the, the relationship between the e finite increment and the derivative of a function, so they meet the theorem that when you have a derivable function defined in an interval, if f a and f b are equal, then there is a point in which the derivative is zero. Okay, I claim that mathematicians doing this <laughs> probably have a kind of uh, um, drug in their brain, uh, and they believe that the reality of mathematical objects uh, uh, is similar to the reality of the computer you are using or the reality of the seat on which you are sitting in this morning, in this moment. Okay. So, uh, following mathematical Platonism, physicists discover physical reality and mathematicians discover mathematical reality. Okay, uh, this is rather amusing. I heard uh, a platonistic mathematician who claimed that something was true because he had seen it. So somebody can come to you and say, this is the why I have seen it. <laughs> and you must accept it because this has been seen. Okay. Okay. So uh, let us, you know, I, I'm going very slowly. When I gave this lecture to the philosophers of science, I, I was much quicker, but I, I want to hammer in your head some ideas because otherwise, when talking about technical details of the mathematical theories, I want to present to you, we will lose a lot of time. So I, I hope that with this, uh, preliminary discussion, uh, we will uh, save time. Uh, let us check if I'm right or not in this course. Okay, so what is falsificationism? A conjecture is made about a model to describe the observed facts, and an a posteriori check is made about how much can be predicted on the basis of the conjecture made. So, coming back to the example, if you are Eudoxus, you conjecture that for every planet you can find a finite number of spheres and you describe the motion. Or if you are a follower of Aristarchus, you conjecture that the sun is in the center and the planets are moving around. How do you distinguish between these two? How do you choose Occam razor? And how close are the predictions with the experiments? 
Okay. Now, I want to conclude this discussion about philosophy of science, proving, and I think this is an original uh, idea I had, by the way, I wrote one paper about this. What I think is that the first implicit exposition of falsificationism, to my knowledge, can be found in Archimedes' uh, method. What is Archimedes' method? You know, as this is a long lecture, I try to uh, make intervals. Uh, I tell you something difficult, then I tell you some a story so that you can relax. You know, this is an ancient trick written in Greek books of rhetoric. Sorry, you can pull openly my leg about my fixation about Greek uh, culture. You know, I studied in a classical school, so uh, I, they were teaching me these things. Uh, by the way, rather interesting that uh, yesterday, yesterday you met uh, Anil Misra, my friend and colleague from Kansas of Indian origin, and you have seen how we like to joke uh, about our uh, ideas. Okay. <laughs> now I tell you a secret. Okay. Anil Misra studied in a school run in India, in a school run by Dominicans. Okay. And these Dominicans were so clever that they replaced uh, in the program of studies ancient Greek, which I studied in the classical school in Italy, with Sanskrit. So the program of Anil, of the studies of Anil, is exactly the same of my program of study. We, we are more or less, we have the same age, but instead of Greek, he learned how to use, how to construct, construct sentences and how to write, learning Sanskrit, okay? And talking about Sanskrit and ancient Greek, what we discovered that the grammar and syntax of Sanskrit and ancient Greek are the same, are extremely similar, okay? So this fixation is, uh, you know, simply showing a, a, an important truth seen from the point of view of South Italians, okay? But the same truths can be seen also studying Sanskrit. Okay, how do we know what I will tell you about Archimedes? You should know that Archimedes Codex C, unfortunately, was not in the hands of Leo the mathematician. Okay? So this book or Okay, he did not manage to have copies which remained in, in Constantinople, okay? So what happened is that maybe you can see something written in this direction and something written in this other direction with some drawings, okay? Now, what happened? The parchment, those ages, was very expensive. So somebody decided that this complicated mathematical, this complicated mathematical theory was totally useless in practice. So using 
a scratcher, they scratched the ink, but you know, they did not want to pierce the parchment. So the shadow of the drawing and the shadow of the Greek text remained. They cut the parchment in smaller pieces and they wrote a Greek text about prayers against flu, which is a more practical use of, you know, mathematics is totally useless. Instead, some prayers against flu are more practical. Okay, this text was lost for a lot of time until the beginning of 20th century when a librarian in Constantinople, nobody knows how this parchment came back to Constantinople, the librarian of the library of the Patriarch of Constantinople wrote a catalog, printed this catalog, and distributed this catalog all around Europe. Heiberg, who was a professor of Greek mathematics and philology in, in the Netherlands, reading three sentences written in Greek, copied by this scratched document, because the librarian was so careful that he said, I have a parchment about prayers on against flu, but I read on the other side a more ancient text, and I read these sentences on this page. Okay. Eiberg reading these sentences understood that this was the lost work of Archimedes, of which he knew only the title. The title was On the Method. Okay. Now, before I tell you about Archimedes, I want to tell you that inductivism, what is inductivism? You observe many things and after you have observed like the chicken of the chicken of uh, Petra Russell, you formulate a general statement and you have a theory. Falsificationism instead is based on conjecture proposal, being ready to change your conjecture. Now, in modern times, they claim that big data treatment can allow us to get theories data-driven. And there is now a violent debate about data-driven or theory-driven models. So actually, while we believe that inductive, naive inductivism was gone, now data-driven is a modern name of this ancient, of this ancient uh, philosophy. By the way, I must tell you that last time when Anil Misra heard this presentation at this point, he told me, I, he asked me a deep question. And I, I want to share with you now the deep question and the obvious answer. Of course, I don't believe that human brain is gifted with Holy Spirit or something like that, which makes it different from a computer. So the creative invention of a model is in a way data driven and we have a brain which works 
making connection between what we observe and these connections allow us to formulate a theory. But what I want to say is that first, no available computer and available software is for the moment strong enough, powerful enough to reproduce this process of human brain first. Second, both human brain and artificial intelligence will never be able to induce from data a universally valid law. OK? So what I claim is that soon our work, soon or later, I don't know, uh, the brain of human beings will be uh, helped by an artificial intelligence for formulating, for conjecturing in a falsificationistic way, new models. But neither human brains nor artificial brains will never be able to induce a theory from experimental evidence. OK, so this is what is important to say now. By the way, you, you maybe you have read about science fiction. Maybe they will implant in our brain an hard disk with 20 terabytes of memory, and we will become much better in doing things. I mean, who knows? But uh, you know, th this is another another story. Okay. So, in falsificationistic theory, the most crucial word is hypothesis. Hypothesis is a fundamental concept, which is the etymology of the word hypothesis. Statement set in the foundations. It comes from the Greek, eupo and thesis. So thesis is statement, eupo is under. So this is a statement under. Okay? So this is uh, the an hypothesis, a postulate, is what is at the ground of our theories and using rigorous logical procedure, Aristotelian logics, one that uses consequences that can be confronted with experimental data. Okay? Now, as I told you several times, it makes no sense wondering a priori whether hypotheses are true or false. This is totally meaningless, OK? I repeat you the example I did already one time. The basic postulate of classical mechanics is the existence of an inertial reference frame, OK? So when you study classical Galilean mechanics, what you what you do? You say that an inertial reference frame is a frame in which an isolated body moves with a, a small. I mean, it's not be that's not to be big. So. A body uh, about whose rotations around the body center you don't mind. So a body having a small dimension compared with the big distances it is traveling. Okay. So using the words of classical mechanics, a material particle travels when it is isolated with constant velocity. So it is rectilinear motion with constant speed. Okay. Then you have the basic postulates of mechanics. Which is the basic postulate of mechanics? There exists at least one inertial observer. OK. Try to prove this experimentally. 
what you should do you should consider the infinite set of observers and you should check for every observer what happens to the infinite possible material particles which are isolated okay this postulate nothing nobody no computer no artificial intelligence nothing can prove experimentally this statement okay now saint thomas aquinas believed and this is the beginning of theology you know philosophy of science is uh, 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 a delicate business. You risk to fall on one side or on the other side. Saint Thomas Aquinas, who was the founder of Catholic science, in a sense, okay, claims that if you concentrate enough inside your brain, as God is giving us Holy Spirit, Okay, you will find the proof of this statement. Okay, this is also a position which cannot be, uh, which cannot be accepted. Okay, so what I want to say is that the work of a scientist is rather unhappy. A scientist must postulate one after the other conjectures, deduce from these conjectures uh, every conceivable theorem, then he has to check if these theorems are in agreement with experience, and if he gets enough agreement with experience, then he uses this model. Okay. Before, before concluding the lecture of today, let me tell you uh, how we can use the postulate of inertial, the existence of inertial observer, plus the assumption that the observer whose center is in the sun and whose axes are fixed with respect to fixed stars is an inertial observer. Then you write down Newton equations, you solve them, and making purely deduction using Aristotelian logics, you arrive to the conclusion that the motion of planets are ellipses okay then after having made this observation you go in the sky using a telescope you observe the position of the planets and you get a verification of your theory okay but you are not proving it. You are simply proving that your observations are not falsifying the theory of Newton of universal gravitation. Then what happens? You start observing Mercury and you discover that Mercury, no way can be predicted the motion of mercury no way can be predicted with with uh, newton laws so you understand that you must very change your theory and how you do it you introduce a maximum possible velocity the velocity of light you introduce a correction of the equation of the motion which depends on the ratio between 
the speed of the planet and the speed of the light. This ratio is small for every planet except Mercury. So you have a more general theory in which you describe everything which was described before plus what was not described before. So in this way, you get another more efficient conjecture theory, which gives you a better description of experimental evidence. OK. Is general relativity true? No. We cannot prove that general relativity is true. We can only say that up to now, no experimental evidence is falsifying general relativity. This is the only thing which we can say. OK. Very well, so I think we can stop now. The video recording. And